This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 124 is brought to us by Bybit because crypto traders continue to take gigantic W's. I'm sure they take L's sometimes, but they're not nearly as big as these W's. My God, it would have been impossible not to score big this week. So I hope wherever you're trading, you're out there trading and doing well. But we all know the benefits of doing things on Bybit by now. No SEC nonsense. They have a completely decentralized version. If you'd like to go that way, you can trade on MT4 and the bonuses. Oh, the bonuses. All the rebates, giveaways, contests, options, so many things, but you have to click on my link. Where's my link? It's down below in the Bybit blog. Scroll down to near the bottom, click the link, and you are on your way. Because with Bybit, membership has its rewards, but only if you participate. It is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. And a quick programming note before we go too far forward. Uh, November is busy for me in terms of travel and in terms of travel that requires my carry-on bag and in my carry-on bag my microphone hardly ever fits it's just what it is so I told people on Wednesday there there would be no uh, indicator profile series video on Wednesday there's also going to be no 10 minute contrarian podcast episode next Saturday we will resume the Saturday after but then after that I have a wedding to go to in the states and uh, I'll let you know Probably won't be one there either. And this is very rare. I'm very consistent with this thing. So I don't mean to leave you guys wandering off into the void for two weekends, but just wanted to prepare you for that. Now, as far as episode 124 goes, I mean, what else are we going to talk about this week? This this is the big news. Uh, really, the last two weeks have been great for Bitcoin. It had two pumps. Uh, the first one, well, before I say that, who follows me on Twitter? If you do... You will know on October 11th, I posted that I was actually buying more Bitcoin. I didn't want to. I didn't like where price was. But smart people in the ETF world, as opposed to dumb people on crypto Twitter, have been saying that the approval for a spot Bitcoin ETF in the United States is not imminent, but has a pretty high chance of happening before the year is over. Um, Color me skeptical, but I'm not deep into that space like they are. And once this does happen... I think we really do see some sort of decoupling. And how could you not, you know, with all the different cryptos out there, to have one that has this type of access to institutional money, while the rest of them so far don't, I mean, ETH probably will someday, that's a really big separation. We've talked about it on the show, how this next real bull run is going to heavily rely on institutions coming in. And so far, we're looking pretty good in terms of that roadmap. But anyway, two weeks ago, we had a, a pump that was based on fake news that a Bitcoin ETF had been approved. We saw some selling after people finally figured that out. And then it went back up and it just kind of stayed there and hung there for a while. And then this week we had another pump up. And if you guys don't know, uh, this was because even though we don't have the ETF yet, there was still a lot of institutional buying. So I think they have finally figured out what, you know, I had figured out back on the 11th that even though I'm waiting for lower prices, hopefully to like really, really unload, if that day never comes, I want to get one of my last tranches in now. I think as far as being historically correct goes, Bitcoin is still a smoking deal at these prices. But as a disciplined value investor, my superpower is that I stay a disciplined value investor. So we'll see how all that goes. I had told you in the past that if crypto is just up only from here, then great. My bags are packed, and I hope yours are too. But if we get really cheap prices, then I wouldn't mind buying some other bags and load them up big time. That would be an ideal situation, but I know too that ideal situations in investing hardly ever happen. There are people, and it's funny, it seems like every block of $5,000 when it comes to Bitcoin. You get completely different narratives from people. And I try to ignore them all um, because when it's really low, the sentiment sometimes is too low. And when it gets higher like this, I think people declare victory way too early. And I think even some of the smartest people out there do this. Now, the problem with some of these predictions, I think, has to do with technical analysis And contrarians, you guys know, this is coming from somebody who has made their name in the technical analysis space. But I've also said 
the technical analysis is a really bad predictor of future price. We use it on my channel simply to determine the probability of something going up or down for a, a reasonable amount of time, but we have no idea how far and how long it's going to take to get there. Now, that is legit crystal ball type stuff, and I don't think technical analysis does a good job of that. You can make it look like it does a really good job of that, especially in hindsight. Now, but that's another rant for another day. But I think there's just a lot of people out there that think, oh, if this resistance line breaks right here, then we are off to the races and we are off to new highs. And that's almost never how things work out. And the same on the bear side. Oh, if we break this support line, we're going back down to $10,000 Bitcoin. No, you're probably not. But through the magic of hindsight driven technical analysis, you can explain this away another day. So you're never completely wrong as a technical analysis on Twitter or YouTube. It's funny. It's, it's this type of wizardry. I don't know what the name is. It's got to have a name. It's not fomenting. I don't know. I've been searching for this word for the, the better part of 10 years. But anyway, as soon as somebody throws a chart up and tries to explain why they think something's going here at a certain time, or just going to this level in general, Please ignore them and understand that the reason why we don't do technical analysis on this show is because when it comes to investing, it is almost always about fundamentals, at least long term. And that's what we're doing. And also, don't forget, we probably have a pretty rough recession coming in that could last a while. And what is that going to look like? What is that going to do for decoupling for Bitcoin? What's that going to do for the altcoin market? Because despite what anybody tells you, Bitcoin is not a flight to safety. We've said this many times, and absolutely nothing has changed. Sentiment on this may have changed a bit, but believe you me, when the proverbial poop hits the proverbial fan, we'll see where people really run to, especially if Bitcoin's dropping during this time because people are liquidating their positions. Um, it is still, and it will always be, the United States dollar and gold before it will ever get to Bitcoin. I mean, if if I had, let's say I had all of my money on crypto and I couldn't put it anywhere else, all right, just some parallel universe where this was the case, right? And let's say all of my USD was in Tether, uh, which most of it is right now, and Tether was in trouble. You know, where would I put my money in a pinch? So the first thing I would do is look for another stable coin, probably USDC. And, but if I couldn't do that, then I would probably move it to Pax G, which is blockchain gold. And then only after that would I probably move it to Bitcoin as my third option, assuming it all had to go to one place, right? And this is just on the blockchain. This is if the blockchain was my only option and nothing else was, the Bitcoin would still be my third choice. But look, contrarians, make no mistake, everything we're seeing right now is very bullish for the future of Bitcoin, and it may not retrace too much, especially if we get that ETF. I have no idea what it would do in a recession if all these things were true. And the scarcity part is something that I don't think we could ignore. So my blog post this week was going to be going deeper into the actual scarcity of Bitcoin. But I decided to turn it into a podcast episode, so maybe that's the one we'll see in a couple weeks, because remember, we're off next week. But I would talk about it here, but I think it actually deserves its own dedicated episode. So be ready for that. And it broke my heart that, once again, I didn't put a blog out this week, because, as I always say, a writer's block is a very real thing. Uh, but don't think I am ignoring that. That is one of the biggest selling points to Bitcoin. So even though we're at these higher levels, is my sentiment changing? It will once that ETF gets approved. And just on Bitcoin. Now, the rest of the market, we don't know. I'm sure this will pave the way for greater institutional adoption, greater pathways to that. But you got to remember, everybody knows Bitcoin. Institutions also look after their downside. And Bitcoin has the least amount of downside out of all of them, or at least most of them. So we'll see. If we ever do get this recession, we'll see how it really shakes out. So I guess cautious optimism would be the correct word here, uh, but not so much on altcoins. Now, speaking of altcoins, we had a handful of them jump up a lot. Uh, meme coins they, they never pass up a good chance to pump for no reason, so uh, they went up a lot. But in terms of actual businesses that do actual things, you know, things we like to invest in, friend of the program, Chainlink went up by almost 50% this week. 
during this jump up. Should it have? No, um, but you know, it's not like everybody just woke up one day to the wonders of Chainlink this past week. That's absurd. But a few people did, and it's about time. We've been talking about Chainlink on the show for a while, a long time now. Uh, we did a dedicated episode and then another episode where I said I was buying more, and uh, some people didn't like it. They're like, oh, you know, it's an older token. You know, people don't talk about it much anymore. It's their same rationale with Litecoin. It's like, guys, I'm going to invest in things that I know work and I know are accepted and I know are also growing. Litecoin, for example, just did record on-chain volume this week in its history. But with Chainlink, you know, people are talking now what I've been saying for a while, what you guys have known for a while. This is by far the number one oracle in all of crypto, and everybody needs an oracle. Almost every token out there uses an oracle of some sort. Blockchains can't get information otherwise. They're, they don't have the capability inside the blockchain itself to do that. So not only does Chainlink have that network already set up, they set up a CCIP, which is a Chainlink improvement proposal protocol, you know, same as an EIP for Ethereum. You, know, you hear these things every once in a while. They don't usually mean a whole lot, but this one does because what this is attempting to do, what CCIP is attempting to do right now, is connect all of the blockchains together. Now, there have been many projects who have attempted to do this in the past, and it's a tall order, and they have not done a great job. But Chainlink has the right people in place. They already have the network in place. They already work with all these blockchains, and this would be the real game changer. I don't know what to compare this to in the, uh, the old school Web 2 world or Web 1 world, maybe JavaScript. I don't know. But that's really big. And that's been the story this week. Now, the fact that people are just waking up to this and that made the price go up by 50% doesn't really connect for me. Uh, but at least it's good to see Chainlink getting the recognition it deserves. And I think everybody, and this is not financial advice, this is just buddy advice, everybody listening to this podcast right now should have some Chainlink exposure going forward. And if you're choosing one of these new came-out-of-nowhere tokens over something like Chainlink, then my advice is really not for you in the first place. I think the combination of upside potential and downside protection trumps extreme upside potential every time, especially in a market like this. So solutions time, if it's not already obvious, there won't be anything uh, new in terms of solutions this week. Uh, but it's the same as always, you know, be historically correct. Make sure your bags are packed to where if crypto just takes off and never looks back, that you don't have a giant feeling of regret, um, but also be mindful that the economy is a mess and riskiest assets often go first when things really start to fall and maybe have some cash set aside for that because opportunities are going to be everywhere, not just in the crypto market. Uh, this, this podcast will be on fire if things start to, to fall and bottom out heavily. Because buying opportunities will be everywhere, and then the game we'll have to play then is, well, should we buy them now, or are things going to go down even further? I'm sure we'll talk about it. But I will talk to you in a couple weeks, and thank you all for listening to episode 124 of the 10 Minute Contrarian Podcast, where we are perfectly fine with being crazy now, if it means we got to be early in the end.